Well, if you miss it, you can see it online because Logan has been getting all of the videos on. So if you've missed any of the Luke 11 that we've been going through, I challenge you to go watch them and to thank Logan also for doing that for us on YouTube. If you need help trying to figure out how, one of us can tell you. Let's start with prayer. Father, we thank you so much for the opportunity to come and freely worship you. We thank you for everyone that's here today. We thank you for the words of Jesus. That He didn't say what we wanted to hear, but He said the words that would save our lives, that would teach us how to be children of God. May we hear Your words and apply them to our hearts today. In the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. Also, you can find on Facebook, Jacob's going to put an invite to the community worship service, so please invite everyone to that so they know about it coming up. So woe is an interjection. It is a Greek word from the word ui, like is in ui, gui, ui. That's how I can remember it because I have a hard time pronouncing these words. It's an interjection that is used to express utter grief, regret, or distress. An interjection starts a sentence right, as we heard, right? And I remember those from way back when in the 70s, I guess, is when those were. The most ironic thing, though, that I noticed with the video is that it ended with hallelujah. What does hallelujah mean? Praise be to God, glory to Him. I don't know if they realized that when they did that, but that's perfect for this sermon because we can say hallelujah, praise God that He would send His Son, that His Son would die for us and teach us how to live like Him, to be that light to the world. And when we can't do it, which we find out that we can't, as we're studying Romans 7, we get to Romans 8. Romans 7 says, what a wretched man I am, because I try over and over again to do as I know that my mind wants me to do, because I want to live for God, but I can't, because I still live in this world, and I'm still under the influence of sin, but not the power and control of sin. Because Romans 8 tells us that we're under the power and control of the Spirit. So hallelujah, praise be to God for that. Does your Bible have an exclamation point? It might have a comma, but I think the feeling is strong. So I'm going to use exclamation points all throughout these woes. Um, the feelings that Jesus said were strong. They weren't because He disliked the Pharisees, that He hated them and the experts in the law. It was woe to them because they wouldn't repent. Jesus' uh, time on, his, on earth when He was in His ministry started with repent for the kingdom of God is at hand. John started his ministry with repent for the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent. We need to change our way of thinking. If we change our mind, hopefully our hearts can be influenced and we can come from the inside out as the song says. And as the other song says that they sang, it's a process. Keep making me to be more like you. So I have to ask you a question. How do others view you as a Christian? Not as a person, not as their friend, not as their mother or bro brother or anything else, but how do they view you as a Christian? That's what matters. <clears throat> do they see Jesus shining through you? Or do they see an actor who wears a mask? A hypocrite. We don't like that word. But it's a word that Jesus used for the Pharisees. And if He was here today, would He use that word for some Christians? I think you'd have to say, yes, He would. Would He ever use that word for you? I know He would use it for me. I can say that. So I want to desperately listen to these woes that Jesus has to say. But Jesus is saying, Woe, you don't have to have this terrible outcome that the Word implies. Because all you have to do is repent, take on my yoke, because His burden is light and He'll show you the way. He's empowered you, left you with the Spirit to do all of those things for you. Pharisee is a Hebrew word from the, the root word uh, parish. It means to set apart and distinguish. The Blue Letter Bible gives this definition for Pharisees. It says, A sect that seems to have started after the Jewish exile. In addition to the Old Testament books, the Pharisees recognized in oral tradition a standard of belief and life. They sought for distinction and praise by outward observance of external rites and by outward forms of piety, such as ceremonial washings, fastings, prayer, and almsgiving, and comparatively negligent of genuine piety. They prided themselves on their fancied good works. They held strenuously to a belief in the existence of God, good and evil angels and to the existence of a Messiah. And they cherished the hope that the dead, after a preliminary experience 
either of reward or of penalty in Hades, would be recalled to life by Him, and be requited each according to His individual deeds. In opposition to their unsurpassed dominion of the Herods and the rule of the Romans, they stoutly upheld the theocracy and their country's cause, and possessed great influence with common people. According to Josephus, they numbered about 6,000 in the time of Jesus. Yet they were bitter enemies of Jesus and His cause. Good people with good intentions that don't see the truth the way it's supposed to be because they don't see Jesus. They continue to put themselves on the throne or whatever is wrong in their lives. The word occurs around a hundred times in Scripture, all in the New Testament, and almost every occurrence is in the Gospels because of their confrontation with Jesus. They sit opposed to His ministry. They should have seen who the Messiah was. They were set apart to bring about a holy nation. They did this because the Jews had not obeyed the commands of the Lord. So they said, we'll set them an example, but look what happened to them when they followed by their own might and their own power. <clears throat> they lost their true focus. Their heart wasn't set on following God's commands, so they got trapped into trying to live the letter of the law. And no matter what we do by our works of righteousness, we will never, ever, ever reach salvation. We will never, ever reach God. Here the Messiah stood before them, and they did not recognize it because their hearts were blinded. Because what they thought was inside was darkness, as we've already seen from this chapter. And the darkness will take over, and there won't be any light. But Jesus came, the true light of the world, to expose the darkness. And all that will rely on Him should have that same light shining in them. So let's get personal. How is your heart? What do we need to do? What is Jesus saying when He says, Woe to Alan, or woe to whoever? What is He saying to you? Are we that much different from the Pharisees sometimes? Do we oppose Jesus? Do we do some of His commands? Or do we follow Him with all of our heart? Realizing that, wow, a God of the comprehension that I cannot even fathom would choose to create me and then would choose to love me even after I rejected and rebelled against Him and said, I want it my way, not your way. And He would love us. That He would love us so much that He would send His Son to take on our iniquity and shame. We were talking some in our men's Bible study, and I asked the question, I said, how many times do you think you sin a day? And at least I got an honest answer. I think Merle gave me 20 or something. You know, I was expecting four or five maybe. But take that. I'm, I'm not that good at math. Well, I am, but not higher math. I've always liked to think I was good at math. But when we start counting these numbers up, I lose it. If we do 20 sins a day, 365 days a year, and live to be 75 years of age, what a multitude of sins. I have no idea what that number is. And multiply that times all the people that have ever lived and will continue to live until our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ returns. Wow. And He took every one of those sins upon His shoulders to set us free. If we would just simply repent believe, and follow after the true light. <clears throat> so are we that much different from the Pharisees? Woe, with an exclamation point, is what we see before us. That interjection that says that there is coming distress and everything, but there doesn't have to be. That's why Jesus was saying these woes. Not to condemn them, but to lead them to repentance. In the Old Testament... The word has basically the same definition. Hosea chapter 7 verse 13 reads, Woe to them because they have strayed from me. Destruction to them because they have rebelled against me. I long to redeem them, but they speak about me falsely. God has been faithful. He will remain faithful, thank goodness, for His character and His ways. He continually offers us mercy and grace. But of course there will be a time when He sets everything right through Jesus. Jesus has already done that on the cross, but He will return and there won't be another opportunity to repent. But we have that chance today. The sun's still shining. We're still breathing air. We can repent today. And hopefully we can draw others to repentance. Woe is a terrible thing to have to hear, but sometimes it's necessary. Jesus is saying it before it's too late. We still have time. 
we still can simply get on our knees and say, Forgive me, Father. I give my life to you. Wow. Hooray. Hallelujah. Interjections. Because that is our God and our Savior. So let's get excited about these interjections of woe. And let's start living a life for Jesus. All we have to do is repent. It's amazing that Jesus would, would be compassionate for these people that so much were against Him. They tried to catch Him with every time and opportunity that they were around Him. They tried to trap Him in something. And He continued to love them, even to the cross. It's a terrible thing to be called a hypocrite, but sometimes it makes us think, doesn't it? So that we can turn from our ways, that we can believe and follow after Jesus. Luke continues to stress the importance of the kingdom of heaven because the kingdom of heaven had come. It's what John the Baptist foretold, and now Jesus the Messiah, the true Messiah, was standing in front of them, and they couldn't see it. They were blinded. So Luke writes his gospel in an orderly account so that we can see this and so that we can know how to live as citizens of the kingdom of heaven, which is here now and will forever be for all of eternity. So we need to learn how to act and live as citizens of heaven. Isaiah chapter 64, verse 5 says, You come to me, you come to the help of those who gladly do right, who remember your ways. But when we continue to sin against them, you are angry. How can they be saved? How then can we be saved? All of us have become like one who is unclean, and all our righteous acts are as filthy rags. But if we keep on reading in verse 8, it says, Yet you, Lord, are our Father. We are the clay, you are the potter. We are all the work of your hand. But you've got to let him mold you. You've got to let him make you. You've got to empty out yourself as we've already learned in Luke. And if you do that and the demons are gone and you don't fill your hearts and lives with Jesus, then the demons are just going to come back in force. Because you have to fill yourself with Jesus, with the Spirit that God gave you to empower you. So if you've accepted His salvation, His mercy and grace, you've been sealed by His Spirit, you will forever be His child, the child of God. That's an amazing thought. And His Spirit resides inside of you so that you can live a life holy, acceptable and pleasing to God. Wow! With an exclamation point, right? Thank goodness for these interjections. And we're clothed with the righteousness of Jesus. Not because of anything that we've done, but because of what Jesus did for us. So how is your heart? The question again, how is your heart? And do you put on a mask? Are you a Christian like Christ, little Christ? Or are you an actor on the stage? So let's look at, at the passage that we read this morning, starting in Luke 11, verse 37. When Jesus had finished speaking... He's already taught on prayer. He's already given examples and parables. He's cast out a demon. He's, he's talked to his opposition and gave them devastating blows. You'd think the Pharisees would have learned by now, but they want to kick in the teeth too, right? But that wasn't Jesus' purpose. It wasn't to kick them in the teeth. It was to tell them, I love you. Please repent. I'm standing right here in front of you. What you have studied your whole life or what you've set your life apart to, to proclaim the Messiah is here. <clears throat> I don't know if they had gum in their ears or what, but I know there's many times that I have listened to God's Word. I've read it, seen it right there in front of my face, and I've walked away and said, well, I'm not going to do this passage here today. And I'm sure if I've done it, I'm sure you have done the same things. We listen to God's Word, but we fail to act upon it. A Pharisee invited him in to eat with him, so he rent and reclined at the table. But, now that's a conjunction, we've learned that before, it ties something together, and but means a complete opposite. And I think we've played that conjunction junction song, what's your function, right? So help you remember. But a conjunction joins two things, so it enjoys the invitation that the Pharisee gave, because he looked like on the outside that he wanted to learn from the master and teacher. But did he really? Was that really his purpose? We don't know his heart, but Jesus knows his heart. Was his purpose really to ridicule Jesus, to set him in a trap? We don't know. We can assume all kind of things, but judgment is up to our Lord and Savior. It's not ours. Jesus knew his heart, though. The Pharisee was surprised. The King James Version says, marveled at the reaction of Jesus. When he noticed that Jesus did not first wash before the meal... 
This whole episode gets started off or triggered by the fact that Jesus didn't wash his hands before this meal. Now, that's not a law of Moses. It's a law that the Pharisees came up with. <clears throat> it's their extra laws from the Talmud. There is nothing demanding in God's Word that you have to wash your hands before you eat a meal or you're unclean. But there's plenty of laws that have been written by the Jews about this. Laws that we see later as we read in the Scriptures that the experts of the law had made burdensome on the people. <clears throat> so he got upset with Jesus. His true heart condition came out. Regardless of what his motives were to begin with, we see his true heart. And he got upset with Jesus because Jesus wouldn't obey those laws. So how is your heart condition? How do others view you when they say, Oh, Christian Allen, how do they see me? Am I helping to scatter, I mean to gather, or am I scattering? Am I with Jesus or am I against Him in my ministry? Verse 39 says, Then the Lord said to him, Now then, you Pharisees clean the outside of the cup and the dish. So he's saying, You act like you're doing one thing, but in fact, you're doing the opposite. Right here and right now. You may have the best intentions. You may want to bring Israel to a holy condition. But because of what you're doing, because your heart's not focused on me, you're doing the exact opposite. You're leading them away. You're scattering them from the true way, the truth, and the life. You clean the outside of the cup and dish so it looks clean, but inside, where your heart is, where it really matters, you are full of greed and wickedness. Not you have some, but you are full. You are fully against Jesus Christ. You can't serve two masters. But Jesus comes to expose the darkness, and He's saying, Whoa, it's time to repent. Verse 40, You foolish people, that is harsh, void of understanding and truth, because their hearts are so blinded that they can't see the true light that is standing there in front of them, that has already performed many miracles, and Jesus already said that He had performed them by the finger of God. We can look out at creation, and there are people today that look out and say, oh yes, I can see the order and everything. It's the fingerprints of God. But yet because their hearts are dark and they say, I don't want to believe this. Maybe it's aliens. Maybe it just happened. Give it millions and millions of years, it'll work. Well, millions and millions of years just leads to more chaos and ruin. We see the fingerprints of God, but we choose to not accept them. <clears throat> They might look like they were serving off clean plates, but they weren't, were they? So that reminds me of a story. I went to visit an old man that I knew, spent the day with him. He cooked a nice breakfast for me and we talked and chatted. He served me on his best china. Well, I looked at the china and I said, it doesn't look exactly that clean, but I asked him, he said, oh yeah, it's clean, it's clean as cold water can get it. So we've later had lunch. And I looked again, and this time I saw a film and a little bit of crust on the side. I said, do you use detergent when you're using it? What, what's going on? He said, it's the best that cold water can get it. Well, we went on through the day, and as the evening approached, I said, it's time for me to leave. And he said, but stay for dinner. I'll cook you dinner. And I saw the plate again. I was like, I'm going to have to ask again. Are these plates clean? He said, cold water, come here, girl. Here's a dish for you. And she licked it clean. Then he said, come and let's eat. Now that's what the Pharisees were doing. They weren't clean. And they were saying, come and eat what we've got to sell. If you obey all these rules that are so burdensome and tie you down, well, we already know that we can't live a life like that. We cannot obey the law, the Ten Commandments, let alone however many that they had to follow. We can't do it because we're sinful creatures in need of a Savior. And that's the only way that we can get to heaven is that God sent us that Savior. That He lived that perfect life. That He took the judgment of God upon His shoulders and set us free. We've got to realize that. <clears throat> We've got to repent when He cries out to us, Woe! We've got to change our hearts, our minds, and serve Him as Master and Lord. Continue on in Luke 11. He says, But now... In verse 41, But now as for what is inside of you, be generous to the poor. 
and everything will be clean for you. Give lovingly out of a pure heart on clean dishes from the inside out, not on ones that look clean. Now here comes the woes. Look out. Verse 42 is the first punch, the first woe. Woe to the Pharisees. Why? Because you give a tenth of your mint, your rue, and all kind of other garden herbs. <clears throat> you follow to the letter of the law and then above. Because the rue was not even required to give, but they gave it. Some of the spices were. There's all kind of requirements they had. But rue was not one. So Jesus even pointed out, you have your own rules which are, are so overwhelming, but you even give out of things that aren't. You're going above and beyond. But it doesn't matter because your heart's not right. You give 10% of all kind of things. You're really some holy givers, right? I don't think that's what he's saying to them. Because then the next word is but again. You are the complete opposite of what you appear to be. You neglect justice doing what's right and the love of God. What did Jesus say was the greatest commandment? To love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, and soul. And then love others as you love yourself or more than you love yourself, because Jesus died for others. <clears throat> you should have practiced the latter without leaving the former undone. Your heart has to be right no matter how many actions you do and give. Your heart has to be focused on Jesus. <clears throat> many Christians have this principle backwards. I've heard it so many times because they say, Pastor, how much do I need to give? How much do I have to give? And I've preached on that before. Tithe is an Old Testament concept. Jesus gave us a New Testament content, concept. And that's to give it all. To give our life away to Him in service. Because of the blessing, the opportunity, the words cannot describe what God did for us through Jesus Christ. Then we should just want to give everything we have. Paul says to lay our lives down as a living sacrifice which is wholly acceptable unto God in a reasonable act of service. <clears throat> Verse 43, the second punch. Woe to you Pharisees. Why? Because you love created things over the Creator. The most important seats, the ones closest to the front. I'm sure you've seen or been in services where they've had the chairs right up here and, the, and some of them sat up here with their robes on and everything. That's somewhat the same thing. I'm not condemning them. They sat here where they could look out over the audience. They could hear the message and be somewhat of importance. Well, maybe they are somewhat of importance. But it really doesn't matter when it comes down to the scheme of our salvation, does not Jesus said you need to be the least of these. You can look at the life of John. He wanted to rain down fire on people. But then read 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John and look at the theme through it. To love others, to love others, to love others. Who changed this man who wanted to rain down fire except Jesus Christ by the power of the Holy Spirit? He changed John from being someone who wanted to bring out vengeance to someone who wanted to offer love, mercy, and grace. <clears throat> you love the most important seats in the synagogues and respectful greetings in the marketplace. They live for that. How are you doing, Pastor? I don't care if anybody calls me Pastor or not. It's great. I love that they see it, but they don't have to call me that. They don't even have to call me Alan. Just don't call me late for dinner and give me clean dishes, right? <laughs> so, <clears throat> third blow. Woe to you, verse 44. Why? Because you are like unmarked graves, which people walk over without knowing. Now, we don't understand that as much, but if you understand that then... And the King James Version says it a little differently. It says, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, names both of them, you hypocrites, with an exclamation point. Those actors on the stage. So Jesus lets them know, I know your true identity again. For you are as graves which not appear. They're not marked, so I don't know it. And as a result, the men walk over them and are not aware. And they defile themselves. If you've ever been to Jerusalem, the Islamics or whoever put up the graveyard right in front of the gate where Jesus is supposed to enter. Because no holy man would walk through a graveyard. I don't think that's stopping Jesus. Do you, Jerry or Merle? I mean, we saw the graves piled up there. There's no way this is, this is going to stop Jesus from returning. Because, see, you don't walk on the graves because you make yourself unclean. Unclean to the max. 
And that's what they were doing by their hypocrisy. Not because of what they were doing in trying to obey this or that law, but because their heart was not right. They weren't clean from the inside out. The Pharisees were hypocrites. They wore a mask. And Jesus said, whoa, it doesn't have to be that way. All you have to do is repent. For you or yourselves inside are clean and, un and, and dead. Just like these graves, your unmarked graves. <clears throat> that is what happens when one claims to be a Christian, but doesn't follow after Jesus in love and obe obedience to His commands. And they are against Jesus, scattering people rather than gather, gathering people. Matthew 23, verse 27 and 28, and I took this from the New Living Translation. What sorrow awaits you teachers of religious law and you Pharisees, hypocrites, for you are like whitewashed tombs, beautiful on the outside, all appearance just to be beautiful, but filled inside with the dead people's bones and all sorts of impurity. Outward you look like righteous people, but inwardly your hearts are filled with hypocrisy and lawlessness. And remember, he's not condemning them. He's saying, come to me. So how do you look on the outside? But more importantly, how does Jesus view your inside? The Pharisees look like the religious leaders of their day. Some people saw through that masquerade. Some did not. Some looked up to them. Some of them saw them as hypocrites. But they, their purpose, maybe not in that day, their purpose was to bring about a holy Israel that was obedient to God's command. And Jesus wanted to desperately save them to cure their spiritual blindness. There's a second type of religious leader that Jesus mentioned. It's the experts of the law or the scribe, the lawyers. And we know, we know that term when we say lawyers. We can relate to it more. <clears throat> the interpreters of the law. Verse 45. One of the experts in the law answered him, Teacher, when you say those things, you insult us. I don't know what he was expecting because Jesus had already knocked it to them, right? <laughs> I don't know why he thought they, they would be any different. Yes, I do. Because when we're spiritually blind, we don't see correctly, do we? We think that we did nothing right. Surely he won't find fault with me, right? I mean, that had to be what they're thinking. <clears throat> no duh did Jesus' comments mean to insult them. It meant to draw them to repentance. But they were simply saying, hit me too, right? Because they didn't want to know the truth. Verse 46 says, Jesus replied, And you experts of the law, let me make it clear, I'm talking to you, not anybody else. <clears throat> Woe to you. They made sure by making all of these cumbersome laws that no one could obey the laws. That was their real heart's intent. It wasn't to make things easier or better. It was to burden down the people. And as lawyers, I know the loopholes, don't I? Because I help say what the laws were and write the laws and so forth. So I know the loopholes and what I can get around. I know that on the Sabbath day I can lift this if I do this and that and it'll be alright. But the common people might not have known that and it just really burdened them down. I didn't really want to draw others to Christ. I just wanted to make sure I was getting to heaven. Right? If you ever read a legal form today and you're like, how in the world am I going to understand this? And you just wind up signing at the bottom, right? Because you trust that what they intended was, was for your good and your benefit. You have no clue. And there, there weren't much different in that day. <laughs> Woe to you. And there should be an exclamation point there if not. Because you load people down with burdens they can hardly carry. And you yourselves will not lift one finger to help them because your heart's not right. The very intent that they said they were doing to help people understand the law and, and so they could live a better life that way was the exact opposite of what they truly were doing. From PursueGod.org, he'll still give you a little bit of explanation. It says, While following 613 commandments would be hard enough, over time Jewish leaders began to slowly add to these laws in the Midrash. The additional teaching is basically an ongoing comp comp compilation of sermons and sayings by Jewish rabbis meant to interpret the original Mosaic law. The original intent of these additions was to clarify the law, but it ended up adding many layers of complicated re regulations. It was already lengthy in Jesus' day and continues to grow to this day. 
So for the Pharisees, they could only they not only tried to follow six, 613 commands of the Mosaic Law, but they literally had thousands of new commands that were created to clarify the original 613 commandments. For example, in the Mosaic Law, one of the commandments was to keep the Sabbath holy, which means that Jews were not supposed to work on Saturdays. But to clarify this, the Jewish scholars created 39 separate categories of what work means. And within those 39 categories, there are many subcategories. So to follow the rule of not working on the Sabbath, there are literally thousands of sub-rules to follow. And they understood it because they wrote the law. <clears throat> Including how many steps you can take and how many letters you can even write down on the Sabbath. So this is what the scribes were guilty of. So the next verse, verse 47, we see another woe. Woe to you, because you built tombs for the prophets... And it was your ancestors who killed them. You are no different from the Pharisees that I've just said woe to. If you were listening at all, you should have caught what Jesus was saying. And what He's saying here, you're no different. You're the one that killed the Old Testament prophets. And now you build them tombs saying that you honor them when in fact you were the ones that killed them in the first place. And now the true Messiah is standing before them and what's going to happen also? They're going to deny Him as, a, as the true prophet, as the true Messiah, and crucify Him. So Jesus says it a little differently in verse 48. He said, So you testify that you approve of what your ancestors did. They killed the prophets and you build their tombs. So if you didn't get it right the first time I said it, let me change the wording around so that you'll catch it this time. Verse 49, Because of this, God in His wisdom said, I will send them prophets and apostles, some of whom they will kill and others who they will persecute. Therefore, this generation will be held responsible for the blood of all the prophets that has been shed since the beginning of the world, from the blood of Abel to the blood of Zechariah, who was killed between the altar and the sanctuary. Yes, I tell you, if you didn't hear it before, I'm telling you again, this generation will be held responsible for it all. So Jesus, with the scribes, goes even further than He did with the Pharisees because He repeats Himself so that they'll get the point. The Pharisees didn't want to open up their minds and open up their hearts. So to the scribes, he tried even harder. He said, you're guilty of this, and let me say it another way, you're guilty of this. Come to repentance. That's what Jesus wanted them to do. All they had to do was change their way of thinking. The greatest prophet ever, the true Messiah, stood before them, teaching repeatedly, repent, come and follow after me. I am the bread of life but they refused to see it. They rejected and crucified our Lord and Savior. Verse 52, Woe to you experts. Now that's an oxymoron, isn't it? Woe to you experts in the law, because you have taken away the key of knowledge. They should have had prophecy, the gift of prophecy. Not like we have through the Spirit necessarily, but, but the Spirit was working in Old Testament times just the same. They were given the job and responsibility they should have known the heart of the law to draw them to salvation, how much God loves them. Not the burden of trying to, to carry about a law which you can never carry about because we are sinful. And that's the whole purpose that Jesus came because we could not do that. <clears throat> you have taken away the key of knowledge, the key that stood right before them at this very time. You yourselves have not entered and you have hindered those who are entering or were entering, rather, even worse. You're scattering. You're not with me, you're against me. You're not gathering, you're scattering. You're playing a role on a stage, the stage of life, and you're fooling yourself, and it leads to destruction and despair, eternal destruction and, and despair. Woe, 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 will you please listen to me? I am here to save you, not condemn you. John 3.16 says, For God so loved the world that He sent His only begotten Son that whosoever believes in Him shall not perish but have everlasting life. And verse 17 says, For God was not condemning the world but that the world would come to Him through Jesus. <clears throat> the story doesn't have to end the way that it does. Verse 53 and 54 says, When Jesus went outside, the Pharisees and teachers of the law began to oppose Him fiercely and to besiege Him with questions waiting to catch Him in something He might say. They didn't hear His warnings. I hope today you're listening and hear His warnings for your life, because none of us are perfect. 
There's warnings here for every single one of us. But are we going to crucify our Lord and Savior or are we going to accept Him as King and Lord of all? Are we going to live for Him or are we going to keep ourselves on the pedestal and live for ourselves? What about you, O Christian? Do you wear a mask? Do you believe in your heart and love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, body, soul, and follow after Jesus' commands longingly and lovingly? Or do you wear a mask? There's still time to change your way of thinking. Most of you are probably familiar with Jeff Foxworthy. He has, you might be a redneck if jokes. Well, you might not know it, but he also has jokes about where you live. Okay? For example, you might be an Idahoan if often you switch your heat from AC while you're driving and back again in the same day. Okay? You might be an Idahoan, right? Isn't that true? You might be an Idahoan if driving is better in the winter because the hot potholes are filled up with snow. I know my road's a lot better when there's snow on it, right? You might be an Idahoan. Okay, well, let's take that a step further. Those are meant for humor, right? But there's a point to be made there that's truth, correct? So you might be a Christian hypocrite. Ooh, we don't like that, though, Pastor. You might be a Christian hypocrite if you ask for prayer for your neighbor, then get on the phone and say, can you believe they did that? You might be a Christian hypocrite if you welcome someone new to church when they come in, but then think to yourself, why are they sitting in my seat? <laughs> well, I got an even better one for you. You want to put it up on the overhead, Kim? Luke 6, 46. You might be a Christian hypocrite if, why do you call me Lord, Lord, and not do what I say? Those are Jesus' words, not mine. And he repeats that theme over and over and over again. Not to burden you, but to release you from the burdens of this world, to bring you life and life abundantly, so that you can build up rewards in heaven rather than working for the meager material things on this world that will no longer be when He returns. To draw others to salvation in Jesus Christ, an eternal thing that you will never, ever see the, benef ever see the end of the benefits of, that a soul is in heaven and can thank you for getting there along the way that you drew them by having the true light rather than wearing a mask. So have you invited Jesus into your heart? If not, you can today. There's no reason to wait. If you have accepted Jesus, does He sit on the throne? Are you in obedience to Him? Is your heart focused on loving God and loving your neighbor? If not, all you have to do is repent. Give Him that mask, He'll take it from you. All you have to do, we read it early in Luke 11, is ask our Father in heaven... And how much more will He give good gifts to us because He is our Father? So how much more will He give you the Holy Spirit if you ask Him? Woe, woe, woe. A time has come and it's now to accept and follow Jesus Christ, to take off our mask and truly follow Him. Father, we thank You for this passage that Jesus gave us. Forgive us when we do act as Pharisees, as hypocrites. And we thank You that You will continue to forgive us if we'll just come to You. That there's no sin or offense too great that You can't take from us and wipe it totally clean. That You remember those sins no more. That they're separated as far as the east from the west. And Lord, I just pray that we as a body of Christ and as individuals, as this church, Your church, will be a light to this world. I pray for repentance and revival. I pray that we're the light to our Jerusalem, our Bonners Ferry, and then to the world, that we will make a difference, especially in a world that seems to be so darkened, who seems to find any other way to come to truth, if they're even interested in truth, than through the truth of Jesus Christ. Help us not to be stumbling blocks. Help us not to scatter, but help us to be the true light of the world that we can draw others to you. I thank you for your word. I thank you for Jesus I thank you so much that he was obedient even to the death of the cross to save us. And we pray this in his precious, precious name. Amen.